And I want to welcome everybody to our presentation on rail structure interaction. Um, as mentioned, I'm Sean McCauley, and um, I'm going to handle the first part of this presentation. So this is kind of a meaty subject, and we're uh, hoping to give a general overview of RSI for high-speed rail bridges. We're going to break this presentation into two halves, a theoretical or criteria half and a case study or practical half. So uh, let's get going. The California High Speed Rail Project is the story of segments within stages. The whole project involves connecting four major cities in California, that being Sacramento, San Francisco, LA, and San Diego, with the first true high speed rail in America. The current stage is the corridor between Fresno and Bakersfield, and the segment we're working on is CP23. It's a 65 mile, mile stretch that extends from Fresno County to Tulare County. This segment involves 18 bridges that carry high-speed rail trains and 32 high roadway overpasses. Those 18 structures include everything from rigid box structures to viaducts. For those curious, the corridor is designed to carry a northbound and southbound track with 250 mile an hour uh, trains running on them. The operating speed for the line is about 220 miles an hour. So for a standard roadway bridge, we can an analyze the bridge in a bubble. For a bridge engineer, once the trucks leave the approach slab, it's not our problem. We'll leave that to the civil and traffic folks. For a rail bridge, we don't get to make that assumption. The continuous rail running across the bridge introduces an integral relationship between the bridge and the embankment. To better understand the relationship, we have track structure interaction. So TSI is a catch-all term that we use for a whole suite of, anal of analysis that help to ensure that the bridge won't have a negative effect on the track. Our goal, to ensure passenger comfort, safety, and track serviceability. So we do this with a, a couple of different analysis. The first, we'll start with our strength and service models. We can run two different analysis cases. We want to check these with an upper bound and a lower bound stiffness and mass. And we'll start with a frequency analysis. We check the vertical, longitudinal, transverse, and torsional frequencies. The idea is to minimize resonancy effects and properly proportion the structural stiffness. We next do a serviceability check, which is checking the deflections and rotations in all degree of freedoms. The idea there is to minimize deformations for comfort and safety, also minimizes long-term maintenance. And finally, we have the, the two key ones. First being dynamic analysis. And this deserves its own presentation. It basically runs a simulated high-speed train over the bridge. And it does that using a time history impulse function based on wheel and node interaction. If you want more information on that, if you take a look at the, um, the data generator pull down uh, under tools in MIDAS, they have a, a nice little function to help generate those uh, time history functions. The idea behind this is we want to capture an accurate dynamic impact factor, which for high-speed trains can be upwards of 100%. The other thing we want to calculate is deck acceleration, and that's to limit unsafe wheel contact, which is basically the deck springing up and colliding with a passing wheel. But today we're going to focus on that third one, rail structure interaction. The goal behind rail structure interaction is to analyze the relationship between the bridge and the rail. In this, we'll actually model the rail as it transitions from the approach embankment across the structure onto the embankment. And the goal is to get axial rail stress along the bridge, which we want to keep somewhere in the limits of 12 to 23 KSI based on the structure type and load case. We also want to calculate relative displacements at the expansion joints. And that's what that looks like, basically the movement relative to a, a semi-fixed point. Now we all realize the rail is going to experience transient and environmental loading across the entire corridor. We're concerned with is the fact that bridges, due to their concentrated movement uh, at specific locations, that can lead to pe big peaks and stress at those locations. If you picture a very long structure with spaghetti columns, the braking forces or seismic or whatever, can lead to a bridge that deforms significantly. When that happens, all the strain in the rail will be concentrated at the joint, and that could lead to a fracture. So by analyzing rail stress and measuring relative deflection, 
we don't actually need to analyze a rail break scenario because we're in effect making that, uh, preventing that from happening. So let's take a look at what a high-speed rail bridge cross-section looks like. This is obviously a ballasted bridge, but you can imagine a direct fixation cross-section with the main change being adding pedestals instead of the ballast there. The goal in the model is to accurately capture this cross-section, including the real location of the rails relative to the superstructure centroid. Now, Scott's going to show a bit later how we went about doing that. And I want to point out the continuously welded rail. For these trains to run smoothly over long distances, we want to avoid using rail expansion joints as much as possible. This introduces a few issues, like finding a thermal origin. But we have ways of getting around that when it comes to modeling, and we'll touch on that a bit later. So let's talk properties. The most important part of compiling an RSI model is accurately representing the connection between the rail and the deck. The rails themselves are modeled as simple beam elements with custom section properties. And our only concern is axial stress, because the bending stresses are controlled by limiting displacements and rotations. We use linear springs for our vertical and transverse connections. And for ballasted bridges, we can use a symmetrical linear spring for the vertical stiffness. For direct fixation bridges, we need to check uplift in the, fastener, in the fasteners at the expansion joints. So we should be paying a bit closer attention to the tensile capacity of those springs and um, handle it on a case-by-case -case basis or a project-by-project -project basis. So finally, we get to the main event, the bilinear longitudinal springs. What we're trying to capture in the fastener to rail connection, um, what, sorry about that, what we're, trying to <laughs> what we're trying to capture is the fastener to rail connection. Basically, these connections provide a linear stiffness until the rail slips in the fastener and no longer provides any resistance. Let's take a closer look at this curve. Now, hopefully that's not too fuzzy for everyone. This graph represents longitudinal stiffness. And you can see that there's a linear range, which then yields at about 0 0.08 inches of displacement. And if you take a, a note of the units on the vertical axis, it's in kips per foot of track. Now, that's based on a standard 27-inch tie spacing. So it'll need to be scaled up or down based on your actual tie spacing. Now, that's not to be confused with the nodal spacing in your model. For that, Scott will touch on how we calculate the actual spring stiffness later. For our structures, we can assume that the standard 27-inch spacing will be used. To continue in the discussion of properties, we can take a look at the modeling the foundation and embankment. For the foundation springs, we use standard six degree of freedom point springs. We want to accurately capture the foundation performance because the foundation could influence the global flex flexibility a good deal. Our embankment stiffness also needs to be taken into account. Similar to the foundation, we can model the embankment with six degree of freedom springs. However, for a, a pretty good bounding, we can assume that those embankment springs are longitudinally fixed for the purpose of calculating rail stress and relative displacement. Now, if we remember this picture, you can imagine that the stiffer the embankment, the more concentrated the rail stress will be on the rail at that joint. Now, if our goal is to calculate maximum global displacement or calculate the force effects imparted on the bridge due to the bridge being um, restrained by the continuously welded rail, we also need to check a lower bound stiffness um, as that will concentrate more force on the bridge. All right, so next we need to take a look at the loads and load cases. And we can start with our construction stage analysis. In putting together our construction stage analysis, we can actually accurately capture the time-dependent properties of the bridge and their effect on the rail. To do this, we need to take a look at the construction and program schedule and make sure that the rail is placed on the deformed bridge at the right time. So the use of creep and shrinkage needs to be discussed on a project-by-project -project basis. For a ballasted structure, you can imagine the effects of creep and shrinkage on the rail would be minimal due to standard maintenance and reballasting. And even on a direct fixation bridge, the continual slip of the fasteners would have a, a resetting effect. 
especially when you factor in normal thermal movements. If you do intend on including creep and shrinkage, you have to spend some time thinking about the time frame you allow. So a typical 30-year locked-in creep and shrinkage, it's probably a bit conservative. So maybe a two, five, or a 10-year time frame may be more applicable. Now, onto the load cases, we have two nonlinear load case, two nonlinear load cases. Group one looks at two loaded tracks on the bridge, the longitudinal forces associated with those trains, and a 40 degree differential temperature between the bridge and the rail. The second load case looks at one train on the bridge, longitudinal force, a 20 degree differential, and a 50 year strength level earth earthquake. Note that for group one, the longitudinal force includes both braking and traction for those trains. Picture one train slamming on the brakes while the approaching is accelerating. But for group two, we only need to look at a single train braking. I, I doubt anybody's going to hit the gas when they feel an earthquake coming. So for our live loads, we have two vehicles. The first is a modified Cooper E50. This represents both a maintenance vehicle as well as a standard high-speed rail serviceability vehicle. For our RSI models, we primarily use this vehicle, though we use the traction and braking forces from the high-speed trains, which are quite a good deal larger. We also have a high-speed train model themselves. The vehicle pictured here is modeled after the high-speed load Model A standard train. It has varying axle loads and spacings. We use this train for all dynamic analysis as well as for our strength and service checks once we have that dynamic impact factor. Now this typically wouldn't control, but once you start getting into impact uh, over 100%, it could sneak up on you. So let's talk thermal. Now we need to analyze a 40 degree differential between the rail and the bridge. Now as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues with the continuously welded rail is defining where a thermal origin would be. So instead of that, we apply the temperature to the bridge, and what that simulates is the restraining effect the bridge would have on an expanding and contracting rail. Now thermal stress is largely controlled by limiting the thermal length. That's defined by the total length of squashing the rail would see. So a simple span with a pin at one end uh, would have a thermal length from the restraint to the open joint. But if there's a simple span expanding in the opposite direction, effectively adding to the movement at that joint, then the thermal length would extend to the next restraint. You can see that in the top right of this picture. For a frame, we need to identify the point of thermal origin or the point of no movement for that frame. If we're talking about a three-span bridge with equal end spans and equal stiffness columns, that point would obviously be the center of the middle span. Now it'll get significantly more complicated once we start varying spans and column stiffnesses. For our project, the thermal length was limited to 330 feet. Uh, a larger thermal length than that would require a more intensive RSI analysis, and it could potentially require a rail expansion joint. Uh, which, as I mentioned, we, we really want to avoid. So on to analysis types. We've identified a few different required analysis types. We know that we need a moving load analysis for our live loads. We need a nonlinear static analysis for our regular loads. And we need a nonlinear time history analysis for our earthquake loads. If we're going to include creep and shrinkage, we'll also need a construction stage analysis. Now, Scott's going to cover how to transform the moving load a little later on, but I'll focus mostly on the nonlinear static and the nonlinear time history. When we're setting up our models, we need to always keep in mind the MIDAS analysis guide. Now, to access this, you just go to the help menu and you search analysis guide. On this page, they have these nice little matrices with elements and load types, materials, boundary conditions. And for each of these, we can see what types of analysis can be run with each one. So right here, I'm showing the boundary condition tables. You can see the different types of conditions and how they'll react with each analysis type. So for a nonlinear time history, if we use a force type general link, we'll get a full nonlinear behavior. However, with that little one next to the nonlinear elastic link, that denotes that while that type of element can be used, it'll assume to have linear properties. 
So in the foreground, you can see that you actually have the opposite relationship for geometric nonlinear analysis. Long story short, we need to use the elements circled green for their respective analysis. That means a nonlinear elastic link for our static loads and a general link for our seismic loads. Let's start with the nonlinear static. As we saw in that table, we need to use these multilinear elastic links that are shown in this little clip of the tree menu. These are essentially a simplified nonlinear element. Now, when we flip to our nonlinear time history, we'll need to use a force type general link. In particular, a hysteretic spring with a high yield exponent will behave like our fasteners. Note that on this screen, you can see that you can give a general link both a general link both linear and nonlinear behavior. That means that you can use the general link for transverse and vertical springs as well as the bilinear longitudinal spring. And if you do use those properties, make sure that you don't already have those elastic links defined in those uh, in those directions, or you'll end up double counting those springs. Anyway, now this. This means you need two different longitudinal links. This is where utilizing boundary groups can come in handy. What you need to do is define all of your multilinear elastic links as one group and all of your general links as a separate group. Then you can use the handy boundary change assignment feature, looks like that, to turn those groups on for certain analysis. Now, this is a useful feature that allows us to keep everything in the same model, eliminating the need for multiple models. I'm sure we've all had to deal with needing numerous models for similar models with small changes in them. Every time we make one small change to one model, we have to trace it through all of those other models, and it's really not hard to miss something and end up carrying that mistake through the end of the project. Now, a quick note for those curious about the construction stage analysis, you can use multilinear elastic links for those and just add, using superposition, the rail stress and displacement results to your final results. If you want to more accurately capture the yielding results of those springs, you can create an external force simulating the strain and add it to your nonlinear load combos. That's pretty similar to those primary creep and shrinkage load cases that Midas generates when you do a regular strength or service design of a pre-stress or post-tension member. But that has to be factored into your analysis either way. All right, well, now that we got through all the background and technical stuff, let's see how we actually apply everything we've talked about. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott, and he's actually going to take us through a case study. Thanks, Sean. So we're going to go and take a look at this uh, subject bridge for our case study. Uh, total bridge length is 300 feet with the 90, 120, 90 span configuration. It's a cast in place post tension box girder. Uh, each support has an integral bent diaphragm connecting the column to the superstructure. And the foundation is a pile group, which is represented by an equivalent spring in Midas. Uh, this particular structure has a superstructure depth of 10 foot 3 inches. 8-foot diameter columns, and the columns are approximately 20-foot tall. Sean mentioned a bit that the superstructure in this particular case is constructed using beam elements, as are the rail. Uh, each rail line that you can see there represents center line of track, so the particular beam elements have the section properties of two individual rails which is important to make sure that you're getting the proper readout for your rail stress. The, the rail is connected to the superstructure with the bilinear links to represent rail fasteners. Uh, and like Sean talked about, there's the multilinear elastic links and the general links, depending on which uh, analysis we're conducting. And then one other interesting point about this global model you can notice the rail extensions off the end of each abutment. Why that's important is that we need to verify that the rail stress that's induced with its interaction with the structure, in fact, it dissipates into the embankment. And at the end of each one of these extensions is a point spring that through the MIDAS results, we can go and check how much force has accumulated in that spring. And if it's really any appreciable amount, 
then we need to extend the rail extension in order to avoid any inaccurately concentrated force on the structure. Here's another look at a typical cross section on our project. Uh, you can see the center line of track spaced 16 and a half feet apart. So the first step to building the model is to go in and define your superstructure. Like we mentioned, it's with beam elements. And there's really two choices that uh, you have with, the, with regards to the insertion point of those elements. One would be to use the cent, uh, center of gravity of the girder, or the other would be to offset to the top of the girder. Uh, in this particular instance, the insertion point was uh, specified as CG of girder, and that's connected via rigid link to uh, some more rigid elastic links at the top of deck level. And then those rigid el elastic links are connected to somewhat of a dummy node that is set below the, the rail elements. And so the two vertical elements that you see are elastic links uh, set as linear springs for the vertical and transverse stiffness and bilinear springs for the longitudinal stiffness. Um, and that's where you would insert either the, the multilinear elastic link or a general link depending on which analysis case is being completed. This is a couple quick snapshots of uh, how the construction sequence is implemented. So on the left, that would be what the structure is like at completion of post-tensioning. And then for our analysis, we typically varied between looking at one year and two year after completion of bridge construction for installation of the ballast and the rail. So you can see you just flip quickly between your construction sequences and uh, see how the rail gets installed. And again, that uh, involves coordination with either the owner or contractor to determine what the schedule looks like for the rail install. Now interestingly, one of the, the keys to performing the nonlinear static analysis in MIDAS is defining a nonlinear load case. Uh, interestingly, the elastic links will only behave multilinearly with regards to single load cases. So if we use a typical load combination that you would normally define, MIDAS will go and determine the stress in each one of the bilinear links for each individual case and then add that up to give you results. And so what that causes is uh, an elevated stress level compared to what's accurate. And so the way that you need to model your load combinations is using the nonlinear load case. So in MIDAS, under the load tab, you'll click on using load combinations, and that will bring up your list of static load combinations. And when you create a nonlinear load case, that allows for all of those loads to be applied simultaneously, in which case then MIDAS treats them all at the same time and it allows for the fasteners to yield properly. And then really the final step of the model development for seismic, especially in our case, was the time history analysis. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to our model for this bridge and uh, just show some of the features that I just talked about. So the first steps that I wanted to look at are how to define the multilinear elastic link and the general link. So in particular, you'll move into your boundary tab, elastic link. You can see you have a number of different load groups. So for this model in particular, I used rail as my load group for the elastic links. And I would go in then and specify uh, axial, transverse, and longitudinal stiffness. Now this would be for typical elastic link, but we're in multilinear. And so uh, here I'll determine what direction. DZ in our case is the local axis for the fasteners. And uh, what's interesting here is you need to make sure that 
the links themselves correspond to the spacing of your nodes. We chose to use uh, 10 feet as the maximum node spacing in order to economize the computation time, but then also uh, make sure we have accuracy. So in general, 10 foot is our node spacing. And if you'll remember from the uh, fastener properties chart that Sean showed earlier, 2.7 kips per foot of track was the restraint provided based on the standard fastener spacing. So with 10 feet, we would enter that displacement of 0.8 inches where yield occurs, the maximum restraint per fastener of 2.7 times 10 feet, 27 kips. And then the third point essentially just needs to replicate somewhat of an infinite displacement in the rail fastener. We'll call that a foot. And again, keeping the same amount of restraint uh, allows for no additional force to develop in those links. Along the same, uh, same intent would be the de definition of general link properties. So again, that was in the boundary tab under general links. First thing that needs to be done is to assign the properties of a general link. And again, uh, these are in kips per inch and then based on the element size. And to get to the nonlinear properties is where you would specify that ultimate yield in the fastener of the 27 kips. So those are important numbers to remember, uh, particularly the 27 as we look into some results later uh, just to verify that the links are in fact working properly. Right, real quickly, I'll just kind of show a uh, basis of what the construction stages look like. So remember I had the, the image of completion of, of construction of the bridge. Then we go and define a certain rail period, there's certain periods when the rail will be installed. And corresponding to those time frames in the construction stage, would be properties, time dependent properties that are assigned to the materials. So again, in properties, you can assign a creep and shrinkage as well as compressive strength properties uh, so that when you do install the rails, the proper amount of creep and shrinkage will have been realized in the structure um, and will not make its way into the rail as if it was installed on day one. Now one of the challenges of finite element modeling in general uh, is the you can't run a nonlinear analysis with a moving load. And so in order to combat that, we need to determine uh, essentially where to put just a representative static live load on the bridge that's going to create a controlling case. So I'll just show a quick screenshot of uh, what we identified as one of the controlling cases. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know why it's not showing up. Okay. There. Is that? Okay. Up there. Uh, no, right here. Go twice. And just go and scroll that load. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> and right click. Right click. Yeah, we'll move on past that. So I'll show it to you again later. Sorry about that. Um, okay, and then the last I wanted to hit on was the uh, nonlinear load combinations. So we discussed earlier with loads in the static loads, you go and define all your static cases as normal. And then in the results tab, we've constructed our load combinations. Our load cases, excuse me. Yeah, I must have. Okay. And so in order to construct the nonlinear load case, you would hit the use load combinations, and I can essentially use any of these combos, move it over to selected combinations, and that would create a nonlinear load combination for that particular case. And last I wanted to walk through was the time history functions. 
I must have picked down a strip a stripped down model of this. I apologize. <laughs> so um, let's hop back to the presentation then real quick here and I'll go through some results from some of our other modeling. Okay, so this is looking at the group four load combination. The uh, you can see there in the right in the global model, you see the peak stresses occurring at the rail expansion joints. And uh, that's what we'd expect because that's where the most differential movement is going to occur. So this particular case, it's evident that it's a temperature fall case. So as you can imagine, the structure uh, shrinking due to the falling temperature is going to pull on the rail. And so you see peak tensions at the expansion joints and then compression force at mid-span of span two, which is the thermal origin. And uh, just one note with the, the different tensile stresses at each, each expansion joint, that's because of the directionality of the longitudinal forces from traction and braking. And so if you envision all the traction braking uh, to the right of the screen, you're getting your max tension on the left end of the bridge. And for this particular load case, we are looking at roughly uh, 9.1 KSI as the maximum uh, rail stress, which is within our limits. Similarly, uh, this shows the rail expansion joints. And uh, it looks like we have about 9 tenths of an inch of expansion. That's with temperature, uh, live load force. Uh, and, and the rest of the group four load combination. So again, that's within the limits of what we'd expect. So a couple of conclusions here and uh, just kind of good ways to troubleshoot the model is uh, that we want to walk through. So the first one Sean hit on a little bit earlier is the idea of linear, linear superposition. That we cannot combine a, a static and a time history um, nonlinear analysis in order to to really get the springs to behave nonlinearly for both of those forces applied at the same time. And that, that gets complicated in several reasons. Some of it has to do with the initial conditions, uh, you know, exactly what is going on in the bridge when an earthquake happens. It's obviously impossible to decide exactly what that would be. And then what's the initial reaction? What's the directionality of your time history function, et cetera? And so, uh, it is a bit conservative, but in some respects that's good for the linear superposition. So if you take the static loads and the time history loads and combine those, uh, that would be the method for determining your rail stress with those particular load combinations. So troubleshooting wise, a uh, good step is to get into the results tab in MIDAS and go down to the either the elastic links or linear link tables and verify that you are, in fact, getting the nonlinear behavior. So what I have here is a screenshot of two particular nodes and the stress at different load combinations. In uh, the first one to look at there is elastic link number 290, which links uh, nodes 257 and 259 on the left of the picture. And the numbers to, to note there is the group 4, 1, F, that's a temperature fall case with group 4, you see that the force that's accumulated in the elastic link is 34 kips, which is greater than the 27 kip max that we should be seeing. And again, that's because the group 4 case is the linear load combination. And so each the, the rail stress in the elastic link from each particular load case is simply added together. Uh, by doing the nonlinear load combination step in MIDAS, all the loads are applied simultaneously, and you see that the link yields properly at 27 kips of force. Uh, the same thing holds true for the, the other link, 199. It's on the right of the screen. You notice that the mesh size uh, shrinks a little bit there, and that was just mostly uh, because, one, it's good to shrink the mesh near the expansion joint because that's our critical spot of investigation but then also because of some changes in cross-section with regards to the diaphragm of the girder. And so with a five-foot mesh, we'd be looking at 13.5 kips for uh, an expected yield in the, the link, and that's what we see. 
And finally, uh, this is getting back to how you define a live load for your nonlinear analysis because the moving load is not an option. And so one cool feature in MIDAS is this moving tracer. And what that does is after you run a moving load analysis, you can go in and determine where that load was to produce the critical forces on certain elements. So this is just a quick example. Uh, you go into the moving tracer and that brings up this tree on the right. And you go through and you specify what you want to find out as far as where the vehicle is located. So if you want to find the maximum moment caused by the two track loaded load case and you pick a key element that happens to be roughly a mid-span of span 2, find the moment at part J of that element and hit apply. And that pops out the image of this vehicle here that you see. And then the nice feature is this right min max. So that pops out a text file, which you can then copy to the MCT command shell in MIDAS. And what that allows you to do when you're building the model is really to think about, you know, what do I want to find out? Maximum displacement, maximum moments, what, what places? And then instead of just guessing the location of your live load, you're, you're able to determine exactly where it's critical to position on the structure. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge California High Speed Rail Authority and MIDAS for helping us out putting this presentation on. And uh, we can take some questions now. If you have any other hard questions, send them to Sean. If you have any compliments, then I'll be taking those. <laughs> One of the questions is, uh, how was the stiffness properties of the ballast model that was captured with, uh, if we're talking strictly vertical uh, stiffness, there are linear elastic links in the vertical and transverse direction uh, between the nodes at the top of deck and at the rail level. You handle, were the springs changed to linear to do a moving, lo moving live load analysis you to, to determine the critical location for live load. Yeah, so those elastic links will run linearly when, when you run an influence line across it. So what we do is just, as soon as we construct that model, we'd set up our, our live load on the rail and run a live load analysis, a, a traditional influence line. And um, that's going to assume all of those links are elastic. And you know, we haven't seen any yielding longitudinally speaking from a live load uh, from a live load run. Um, so it, it really shouldn't affect it too much if those uh, are run fully linear. If if you did have the concern that you were going to start yielding your fasteners while running a train, then you, you could construct a, an actual moving load with a time history impulse function, but um, you know, we, we found that that wasn't necessary. So another question, how was the column stiffness calculated? Was it based on a crack section? Uh, great question. We actually ran two different load cases, uh, or not cases, I should say, but really just situations or conditions where uh, one would look at an upper bound mass combined with a lower bound stiffness, and the, the other would be the opposite, where a lower bound mass and upper bound stiffness. So both cases were run, one with growth section properties and then the other with the cracked section. And that's essentially just as a bounding case to verify, um, it, essentially to verify some different checks that need to be done because the upper bound stiffness is going to control in some cases and the lower bound stiffness will control in others. We saw another question there was about using, um, needing the, uh, an RSI analysis for a ballasted structure, that it's not, some agencies don't require RSI for ballasted bridges. And um, while that's true for a lot of cases, especially a lot of um, light rail or freight rail bridges, a lot of these high speed rail bridges um, require such perfectly straight tracks to be able to run at really high speeds that um, the rail sensitivity is, is really something that needs to be considered. So we looked at the RSI on pretty much all of our bridges um, and mostly to, to verify that we didn't have any issues, but also to realize that uh, 
On some of the longer bridges are ones with larger thermal lengths with more flexible columns. There did take a little bit of, of, um, of, uh, of working with the models and uh, working with the details of the bridge. So for instance, if we have a bridge with very flexible columns that has a, a very long thermal length, uh, and we're seeing a really big peak rail stress right in that expansion joint there, what we can do is, is we can pin that joint. We can use some type of um, yeah, so some type of restrainer element to prevent the bridge from exp over expanding at that joint. Um, and it, it's it, it kind of goes through an iterative process to make sure that you have um, an adequate amount of, of rail stress. The, the other the other critical thing here is that you know for this high speed rail line with so many segments and stages. Um, we really want to make sure that kind of everything has been crossed off with so many different uh, um, you know, contractors and consultants and you know, and designers getting in there that when this thing is complete that there's a you know every bridge on the project has a full suite of analysis run on it to make sure that regardless of the high speed rail vehicles that are used uh, the bridge should work in just about any case. Yeah, I saw a couple a couple other good ones here. Peak stresses are located on the rail expansion joints or at the structure expansion joints. So that on our corridor there are no rail expansion joints. That's uh, critical for one, the performance of the train, but also rail expansion joints are a, a big maintenance risk in terms of their effect on uh, on the wheels and the impact factor that it results in the entire corridor. So the answer is at the structure expansion joints. Um, Identif do we identify the critical location for live load for longitudinal effects as well as the vertical? The particular longitudinal forces that uh, we're designing to for the, the bridge that we looked at here of 300 feet, the longitudinal force effects are actually longer than the whole bridge because of the trailing, leading and trailing loads. And so there, I guess there is no really other option on the way that that was applied. But for longer structures, then yes, that would be an investigation that needs to be uh, had as far as where the critical location for longitudinal effects is. So one, one question was about the use of fixed bearings on the bridge. And, and this particular bridge that we showed didn't use fixed bearings. We just had the, the two integral connections. But on some of our bridges, we do have uh, fixed bearings. and. Um, on all of our bridges, so most of our bridges we have at some point of, uh, an elastomeric or some type of, of, of you know, of, um, of released bearing. And the stiffness of all of those needs to be built into the model. When we say like stiffness of the, the foundation, we also need to have the, uh, the accurate stiffness of the substructure, the accurate stiffness of the bearings in there. Uh, we want as, as good of a picture as possible on um, the bridge uh, total flexibility. Um, it does make things a bit more complicated when we start getting into uh, fixed abutments, where the you know, the um, the abutment stiffness becomes kind of questionable because it's obviously stiffer in one direction than the other. So we can model that looking at kind of an upper bound and a lower bound, a very rigid abutment, um, and then a very soft soft abutment that's allowed to deflect and, and compare the results. I think there's quite a few questions about how the the actual spring stiffnesses were developed. Those were, for our particular case, are taken from the project design criteria. And there is a different spring stiffness for ballasted versus direct fixation structure. Uh, what we looked at here was just for a ballasted deck. Uh, I saw some other questions also about whether the interface between the ties, the ballast, and the deck is included, or if that's a separate investigation. Uh, we, we're modeling just using the, the single, uh, single stiffness that connects the deck to the rail. So there's not really any different interfaces that are uh, part of our investigation. You saw a question in there about uh, live load on the, the bridge during uh, the service level earthquake. and. Um, we had a, a design case of one train on the bridge uh, during the 50-year earthquake. Uh, no trains on the bridge for the 1,000-year earthquake case. Um, but for the 50-year earthquake event, the idea is that the, the rail line should be completely usable. There should be no interruption of service necessary. Uh, 
So we do want to look at um, the effects of a train being on there as well as the mass effect that that train would have. Um, it's a bit more tied down to the rail than um, like a, a car on a bridge deck is. There's, there's a lot less damping that goes in, in between the, the direct mass application of the, of the single train on there. So yes, we, we considered um, uh, one live load and the mass from that live load. See a couple questions about do we consider a rail break case? Uh, we did not. Sean was mentioning earlier uh, in the presentation that in lieu of the rail rate case, of the, the rail stress limits are kept very low, as well as the allowable relative displacements at expansion joints. And so there's not a rail rate case that's investigated. 